So, I don't really want to just sit here and talk about myself, but I should very briefly just let you know what I am. So, in my day job, I'm a computer programmer, uh, and that's partly because you can't really make money as a paleontologist. <laughs> so, that's what I do um, for, in terms of my career. And then, in the evenings, uh, I study uh, paleontology and dinosaurs in particular, uh, and I've been doing that since about 2000, when, for reasons I don't really understand, I suddenly rediscovered my, my childhood love of dinosaurs. And I, I hope everybody as a child loves dinosaurs. And one of the great sadnesses is that people forget that as they get older. Um, so it came back to me, and uh, I found myself almost sort of accidentally really uh, doing a PhD and writing these papers, and I've, it's been my privilege to name a couple of dinosaurs, which I'll show you soon. So those are two of my three hats, a computer programmer and a paleontologist. And the third one is my uh, involvement with my church, where I, I'm also very deeply embedded. Uh, my wife and I together run the worship of the church. Uh, I preach um, just about once a month. Um, so all these things going on at once and very much feeding into each other. And that's my background. So, uh, and I told you that bit partly just so you know I'm a... You know, I'm a good, solid Christian, and I'm not going off on some wild, speculative, uh, unorthodox ways of thinking. So, this is a dinosaur. Um, if you grew up on kids' books about dinosaurs, you might think it's a Brachiosaurus. Um, it, it's very closely related to a Brachiosaurus. It's a giraffe titan, and it's in the Humboldt Museum for Natural History in Berlin. And unless you were looking very closely at the picture, you probably didn't notice there's me down there uh, next to its elbow, uh, looking very small. Uh, it's probably my single favourite, or my second favourite dinosaur specimen in the world. Um, can we? Which is your first favourite? We'll come to my first favourite. Uh, can we step on a slide, please? So this clicker seems not to be working at the moment. Uh, so same dinosaur, here I am trying to measure uh, the width of its torso uh, up inside its rib cage on a step ladder. Uh, uh, I couldn't do it uh, for the obvious reason that you just can't reach across from one side of it to the other. So what I had to do instead was drop lines to the ground and mark where they were and measure between where they'd landed. Next slide. This is the skull of the same dinosaur. Uh, although, in fact, this is a slightly smaller specimen than the one that's in the main hall. Uh, and I said it's my second favourite dinosaur. If you can make it out, uh, there's actually a fossil on the front of the T-shirt that I'm wearing in that picture. Uh, and that fossil, we can see in glorious detail in the next slide. Uh, and this is it, my very favourite. Uh, this single bone, it's the bottom half of a bone from the back of a, a long-necked dinosaur, uh, which I and my colleague Darren Nash named in 2007. And we called it Xeno Poseidon, which means something like alien earthquake god. Um, and, and it's a, a beautiful specimen that I... <laughs> this picture uh, turned up in the, several newspapers, and my mum, who back then, before she knew better, used to read the Daily Mail, uh, read a, a columnist in there saying... I wish my husband would look at me the way this man looks at me. <laughs> so hence this photograph. <laughs> and there really is a, a beauty about these specimens. I don't know how well you can make it out in the photo, but there's a, a complexity and a structure about all the struts and sheets of bone that come out of them that they inform you if you know the background. They teach you a lot about what's related to what and what the lines of common descent are, but also they're just aesthetically lovely objects. So uh, one of my projects for the next year is to get a, a life-size 3D printed model of this exact bone uh, to live on the mantelpiece in our living room and be the, the centerpiece of our home life. <laughs> and I'm going to have to explain this to Fiona. <laughs> Uh, and this is a, another of the dinosaurs that it's been my privilege to describe and name. And this one, um, we don't have a, a lot of bones of it, though more than we have from Xenoposeidon. What we do have is the hip bone uh, down here. 
and the blade of bone at the front of the hip is much bigger than you would normally expect it to be relative to the size of the bone. So what does that tell us? That it had very powerful muscles running down from the front of the hip to the front of the thigh, uh, which would have made it able to kick forward powerfully. And that's why we had our artist make this reconstruction, where it's kicking a pesky raptor dinosaur out of the way. Uh, and this one, we'll get to questions shortly. Uh, this one we named Brontomerus. Uh, does anyone know uh, a little bit of Greek or Latin? Tell me what that means. That's thunder thighs. <laughs> so, so these are the bones. Um, as you can see, it's, in a way, it's not a lot to go on in reconstructing a whole animal. But the big one you can see at the bottom there is most of the shoulder blade. Uh, and the small one above it to the left is what we have of that hip bone. Now the hip, you can see, is much smaller than the shoulder. That's because it's from a different individual. Uh, not the same animal, but a, a juvenile of the same species. And then there are various vertebrae and ribs and fragments and bits in here that we have no idea what they are, to be honest. They're just too smashed up. But this is what we're working from, fairly typically, in uh, putting together an animal. So I'd just like to talk a little bit now about neck elongation, which is the, my sort of specialism within the study of dinosaurs. So um, there, there are different major groups of dinosaurs. There are the theropods which are the meat-eaters, including Tyrannosaurus and the raptors. Uh, and there's uh, the Ornithischians, which includes all the dinosaurs with horns and armor and so on. And my favorites are the sauropods, and they're the really big ones with long necks, small heads, like the giraffe titan that we saw in the very first slide. And the most obvious thing about that group of dinosaurs is their very long necks. So I'm interested in how those evolved and why they got so very much longer than anyone else's. So to give you a sense of scale, uh, this is a compilation from uh, a paper that Matt Wadle and I wrote in 2013, uh, just showing the lengths of the necks of some of the, the longest necked animals we know about. So there's a human down there, just to give you a sense of scale, with our pathetic, negligible necks. Uh, giraffe has the longest neck of anything alive today, a little over two meters. And then the next longest neck of anything we have now is the ostrich, just one meter, uh, very feeble. But then when we start looking at extinct animals, uh, the next one along there is a thing called Paraceratherium, which is a, a, a kind of gigantic um, rhinoceros, uh, but with, it's built more like a giraffe, though it is a rhinoceros, so long neck and, and legs. Uh, and you can see that its neck is about the same length as that of the giraffe, and also these three dinosaurs next to it. Now they're from three very different groups of dinosaurs. Um, I can't actually read my own slides from here, but as, as I recall, I think there's one of them is Gigantoraptor, uh, one of them is Therizinosaurus, and one is Dinochirus. Yeah. So those are all um, dinosaurs from the, the group called Theropods. And again, you'll notice all their necks seems to top out around the same length, about two meters. So you might feel there's some kind of fundamental limit around the two meter mark that's very hard to surpass. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, the only other non-sauropod that, that gets a longer neck than that is this thing on the right, uh, Aramborgiania. Does anybody have an idea what kind of animal that is? Bird is a good guess, but it's wrong. Go on. No, no, not a fish. Um, step on, I'll show you. Uh, no, sorry, one more slide. Um, it's a pterosaur. It's a flying reptile. Uh, and all the That's evidence... The well, actually... Your answer's right. I mean... <laughs> your answer's not right, but you, but you are right, because birds are flying reptiles from an evolutionary point of view. Um, but the fact that this thing is the size of a giraffe uh, and was actually flying around in the Mesozoic, uh, there's a human for scale... Um, by the, that particular human for scale is Georgia Witten, who is the wife of Mark Witten, who drew this. So there's a nice little <laughs> bit of marital contribution going on there. So this is a great animal as it goes, but uh, next slide, please. Um, if we compare the necks of the biggest sauropods with these, then we can s see that they, they kind of get blown away. So this is just the base of the neck of Supersaurus, 
And on the next slide, we can see how that compares with some others. Yeah, so um, up at the top, if you've ever been to the Natural History Museum in London, um, well, until recently, this act of cultural vandalism, they took down the Diplodocus skeleton. But if you saw it before then, that's the one we have at the top there. And there's various other uh, sauropods, including Supersaurus at the bottom. And if we go to the next slide, you can see how they compare with all the other long-necked animals that we looked at before. So you can see that sauropod necks were sensationally, ridiculously longer than anyone else's. Uh, and if you want the details of why that is, you can look up our 2013 paper, which we wrote in as accessible a way as we could. Um, and I, I don't want to use up the whole of this morning just telling you the details of that, but there are good, solid reasons that explain this. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, a single vertebra from that neck, the Supersaurus neck. Uh, and on the left is the actual fossil. On the right is a sculpture that somebody made back in 1985 of how they think that bone would have looked before it was fossilized and crushed and distorted. And it's pretty good, actually. It's pretty accurate. Uh, sadly, this is the only vertebra we have of this neck, so there is a lot of supposition involved in figuring out how the whole neck would have been. But work that I and my co-author have done since then suggests that, in fact, that neck was even longer than we thought and that the Supersaurus vertebra, so-called, is really uh, from a very large individual, a Barosaurus, which is a much better-known dinosaur. And if we're right about that, and we are, <laughs> then, uh, then we can reconstruct the neck uh, with a, a clearer sense of its size. And this is how long the neck alone would be compared with that gigantic giraffe type that we began the whole thing with. So imagine me again down by the elbow as I was before, compared with that neck. And then think about an animal constructed along those lines, walking around uh, through Peckham Rye, or perhaps more likely through prehistoric swamps, and try and wrap your imagination around what that would be. So those are the animals that I study, uh, and that's the reason why I study them, of course. They are just the best animals. Um, and other paleontologists who work on... Um, ammonites and extinct insects and all those kinds of things, they all had dinosaur envy. They all really, deep down, wish they were working on dinosaurs. And I think even other dinosaur paleontologists wish their dinosaurs were as big as ours. <laughs> uh, so last slide, please. Um, we'll, we'll go into questions, uh, but I'm just going to leave this up. If anybody wants to contact me afterwards uh, and follow anything up in more detail, or for any other reason, uh, these are ways to reach me. So you can email me, you can find me on Twitter, or there's this blog, SVPOW, which stands for Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week. Uh, it's been running for more than 10 years now. It's accumulated 3 million hits. In the world of sauropod vertebrae, it's a hit. Uh, so uh, these are all good places to find out more if you would like to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, so um, I've got some questions here. Actually, I think we'll go straight because we've got some good questions here, and then we'll just throw it out um, to the floor. They, um, and a great one just to start with then. So no dinosaurs in the creation story. Well, that's true. Uh, but then, of course, there are no leopards in the creation story either, and we have no problem with the idea that there are leopards. So uh, that's a kind of frivolous answer, but I suppose the serious point underlying it is that there's no reason to think that the Bible was ever about trying to list every possible thing. It's the things that are written in the Bible are written there to teach us specific things, and a list of all the animals wasn't among them. Uh, we've got a follow-up there. Should you yeah. want to go to that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite possible. That hmm. Yeah, and there, there certainly were. Yeah, you're on the mic. Yeah. 
Yeah, or I'll repeat them. So the question was, there's actually a reference in the Bible to a dragon or a sea monster. Could those have been in Genesis? Could that actually have been um, uh, a dinosaur? So, uh, well, actually, yeah. almost certainly not dinosaurs themselves because they all lived on land, but there were lots of other um, animals living at the same time in the sea. Uh, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, and so on. So it's quite possible that that's referring to one or more of those. But there's really just no way to know. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Yep. Do you want to? Um, I want to ask a really stupid question that a five-year-old would ask. And that is, I have um, perhaps very little faith in science. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just all speculation. And if the only long-necked animal we've got is a giraffe, then why couldn't the dinosaurs all be fluffy and spotty and furry? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you know mm. that they're sort of all... Lois is telling me some had feathers. But, yeah. but you know, isn't it just all your imagination? Right. But there, there, there certainly is a degree of speculation involved. Uh, there's actually a, a well-established field now of paleo art where um, scientifically educated artists try to reconstruct the life appearance of extinct animals. And you can look at you know, three different artists will make the same animal look very differently because there's so much we don't know, you're right, about we don't know what colours they were. It's quite possible that, that some of them had blotchy skin like... Um, like a giraffe or stripes like a tiger. But there is also a lot that we can know. So it's a matter in the science as always of trying to be clear about what's established as fact, what's deduction that we're pretty clear about, and mm -hmm. what's speculation. And our goal as scientists is always just to be clear about which of those is which. So when, you're got, when you've got that picture of you with the huge single neck vertebrate, mm. um, how do you know that that is one big bone, one singular big bone? What did you find that means you know there's a bone that is almost as big as you are, that is merely one piece of an animal's neck? Um, well, because it's a bone. So it's, um, did you find the whole bone? Well, I, I personally didn't. I found it in a museum. But yes, it was excavated as one bone. And you can look at the, the details of the bone and recognize exactly the same things you see in the vertebrae of mammals and birds today. So you can say this long bit here is what's known as the centrum, that's like the body of the vertebra. Above that is the neural spine, which is where various muscles and ligaments attach. There's the neural uh, arch, where the, the spinal cord goes through the hole, uh, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. So there's no question at all that it's a vertebra. really in connection with that because one of the things that fascinates me is how they try and um, establish a lineage between uh, homo sapiens and apes and they do that from the smallest reconstructions of like teeth and bits of jawbone and when you were talking about you know the, the, the bones for a dinosaur and you actually showed what was there sometimes there's a, as, as a, a non-expert you think well how do you extrapolate from there to, to build this incredible animal and certainly in terms of like the, the homo sapien lineage there's so much controversy about this. And one moment you, you read about this, or oh, a link has been established, and then the next thing is, oh, no, it's something completely different. It's more related to an ape than a human. So that complicates the whole picture and makes, you know, that trust in the science that goes behind that very, um, yeah, very tentative. Yeah, so there's a few things to say there. One is, I'm not at all an expert on human evolution, so I'm, I'm speaking as an informed layman here. Uh, but another is to also to be wary about how things get covered in the news. So if you think about how anything is covered in the news, actually, celebrity divorces, politics, um, Paul Pogba falling out with Jose Mourinho, you know, it's always sensationalized, and things are always made to look like there's a lot more conflicts than there really is. So one of the things that paleontologists roll their eyes at is all the while we see newspaper stories that say this new discovery overturns everything we thought we knew. It doesn't. You know, the new discovery each time slightly modifies our understanding of one little subfield. So I think there's a very good chance that the things you're seeing about human evolution fall into that category. 
but then more generally on the subject of reconstructing a whole animal from a, a small set of bones. Um, that's a really important and interesting question. Uh, and in fact, somebody should have asked me that about Xenoposidon, where I only have half of one bone, and yet I'm happily saying it's a sauropod and it's got a long neck. How do I know? Well, the answer is because uh, individual bones of animals carry a lot of signal in the, in the shape of the bones, and particularly uh, the vertebrae of sauropods uh, and the, the holes that are in them, and the way air gets into the bones. So they can tell you a lot about how they are related to other animals that are better represented from, from much more complete remains. So usually what you're doing is reasoning by analogy that what we have of this dinosaur uh, is very similar to the corresponding mass of this other one. So this is similar to that. So can I, um, just in the interest of us making sure we, uh, you know, touch on kind of very difficult topics, you know, and it, it, part of what I think you're asking is, um, do you believe that man somehow developed from an ape? Because sometimes people are, you know, are, are, are ask that and... Um, what does the science say? And if that is the case, if somehow does that undermine the Bible and our understanding of the Bible? If you feel you don't want to answer that because that's not your area of expertise, then do just Absolutely say I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it all comes down to what you mean by a person. So if we talk about did people evolve from apes? Well, I, I think there is solid evidence that our bodies with um, you know, two arms, two legs, uh, the cranium shaped in a different way, there is a, a recognizable evolutionary lineage showing how those bodies evolved from the bodies of, of creatures that look more like apes and then going back, things that look like monkeys and things that look like mice and things that look like lizards and things that look like fish right the way back. But that's not what a human is, is it? We're, we're much more than just our, our bodies. So the Bible talks about uh, spirit as well as soul. Uh, the account in Genesis says it uses this phrase that God made man in his own image. Now, we don't really know what that means, and I think we should be aware of trying to be too uh, certain about that. But to me, what it speaks of is that there's something in us that lifts us above the animals. And you see that in things like uh, every human culture produces art, for example. So where did that come from, I think, is the real question. If you want to know where did humans come from, then in a sense where our bodies came from is, is, is the, the uninteresting half of that question. Why are we human? Why do we think? Why do we feel? Why do we philosophize? Why does every civilization come up with an attempt uh, at religion, at understanding where it came from? And I, I, my understanding, the answer is because God did something, probably with animals that looked very much like humans but were not human, there came a moment where God spoke into those animals, and that's when we became human, I think. Okay, so I think this is a good follow-up question to that. Um, you, whoever wrote this uh, might want to expand on it. If I So some say we are a product of natural selection, the survival of the fittest. However, isn't the reality that we are the most adaptable to change in order to survive? In which case, religion could be a product of this as a way to survive. Now that we have more science and laws, we need less of it. And that's why there's a decline in believers, churchgoers. So I'm not sure I know what the it is there. So I don't know if... Who, um, religion, I imagine, religion. is, is yeah. what was meant there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, my position, as I've kind of implied already, is, is that absolutely there is a, a unity of biological life on Earth, uh, a, a common descent from a single ancestor, and that our human bodies are part of that. But it's also true that however much people try to say uh, we're just animals, deep down we all know, I think, that we're not just animals. We're, you could say we are animals, we're not just animals, there's something more in us. Um, that separates us out from, as though we've, we've transcended the evolutionary lineage that brought us to where we are physically. So, if we think, uh, do we need religion now that we understand where our human bodies came from, from a scientific perspective, well, my answer would be religion never had anything to say about that. It was never interested in that. It's always been about, why are we human? Why do we think, feel, philosophize? And those questions, science doesn't really have a lot to say about. 
So science is about telling you what has happened and how it's happened. But we as humans also want to know why things happened and who is responsible for the things that happened. And those are the questions that Christianity seeks to answer. When we talk about things like religion and altruism as means to an end, what's the explanation for altruism where there's no survival um, benefit to the organism? I mean, there are situations where people die for someone they don't know, which doesn't establish any sort of lineage in terms of, you know, their genes. So that cannot be explained scientifically. And there's a lot of situations like that for things like religion and altruism that have no scientific explanation at all. Would you agree with that? I half agree with it, yes. I think that um, evolutionists can tend sometimes to be like people who've got a hammer and then assume that the solution to every problem is to hit it with that hammer. Um, having said that, uh, there are uh, good and compelling studies on um, evolutionary behavior that I think do go some way to explaining um, some of the behaviors that we call altruistic. So I, I wouldn't want to write it off completely. But I absolutely agree with you that, that evolutionary explanations don't come close to explaining the full panoply of, of human behavior, and particularly human thought. Yeah. Question. Um, I completely understand uh, that so-called um, old earth Christians um, see the creation story uh, as not necessitating uh, six days and so on and so forth um, but the only uh, thing that I struggle with is um, the Bible is clear, it does necessitate uh, that the fall of man occurred um, in relation to human beings, so how do we um, reconcile an old earth um, and, cre and uh, creation before humans, so billions of years, uh, if it is true that uh, God spoke into a group of animals how do we reconcile the fall of man um, with that, are we, aren't we then suggesting that um, creation beforehand was not fallen? Uh, and then as a result, how do we explain uh, death being in the world before humans? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most important answer to that question is I don't know and neither does anyone else. So the, the, most, the best thing we can do with this is have a bit of humility and realize that we're dealing with deep things where it's great to think about them as well as we can, but as soon as we start to talk as though we know for certain what the answer is, then we're just setting ourselves up for a fall. So with... Oh, okay. So with that... Are we on? Yeah. So with that caveat, uh, here's what I think. Um, the stories that we're told in the early chapters of Genesis are in the Bible for a reason, I, I'm convinced as a Christian. I think they're there ultimately because God wants them to be there, because they tell us important things. But the important things that they're telling us are not scientific. So they're not about uh, what order did things happen in and which animals existed and so forth. They're telling us about what's the nature of the relationship between God and humans and how did that come about. So when I read a story about Adam and Eve and about the, the first sin and the deliberate choice to disobey God, to do the opposite of what they knew God wanted. I think there are different ways to read that story that are, are all legitimate. So one could imagine that among all the human-like animals, uh, God picked one pair and made those into humans, and they chose to rebel against God. Or you might think that the story told there is um, like a parable to explain the, the broader story of how every one of us turns against God and does things that we know are wrong. Um, and I, I think both of those positions are defensible. Uh, I may have one that I prefer myself, but it sort of doesn't matter which one I think is right. Because either way, what those stories in early Genesis are telling us is the same thing, which is that we started out loved by God and have made a choice to turn away from him. And all the disaster that follows on from that, that's what those chapters are about. So to, but taking Joseph's particular point about the order of when death came and if death was, had, was there before ma man died because of sin but actually death existed before man existed, does that undermine the creation story if that is the case? So. No. So um, it is an, 
essentially incontrovertible fact that there was physical death long before humans came on the scene because that's why we have the remains of dead dinosaurs. Uh, the thing that it undermines is not the Bible story, it's one specific interpretation of that Bible story. And this is the thing where we have to beware as Christians that we might have a very high view of the Bible and feel the Bible itself is God's word and it's fully trustworthy, but then we can easily slip across from that to thinking my particular interpretation of the Bible is infallible and may not be challenged. But actually, especially with the early parts of the Bible, where there's a lot of very pictorial language and things that read in a very mythical way, we need to have some humility in recognizing that there are different interpretations and the one that we prefer might be right, but also be open to other interpretations. And in this case, I would say, whatever is meant by the idea that death entered the world with the first human sin, the death that it's talking about there is not just the physical death of animals. It's talking about something spiritual. And if you, sorry to go on a bit, but if you want the corroboration of that from the Bible itself, you might remember that what God says is that in the day you eat this, you will surely die. And yet they don't physically die on the day that they eat the fruit. So clearly what God meant by that was something other than physical death. Yep. What a good answer. Thank you. Sorry, I, don't mean to, I should never say that. It goes to your head. Thanks for your talk, Mike. This is a question that goes back to the dinosaurs, but hopefully has some relevance to what's gone before. Um, I took my um, godson to the Natural History Museum a few weeks ago, and it's been a long time since I'd you know, walked around and looked at um, uh, relics of dinosaurs. And it was lovely to watch him kind of marvelling and also feeling a bit scared of some, <laughs> some of the moving models. And for most of us, I think, the, the kind of story of the dinosaurs, it's a closed story, a self-contained story, because they died out. But I'm wondering, what does the existence and story of dinosaurs, if you like, or what might it tell us about the character of God and the mind of God? Um, because if he created them too, um, how do you reflect on their role in his creation and, and what he might be telling us through them? Well, it's one of those things I'm really happy to speculate about. So I think one of the things you could say it tells us is that, that what God ultimately cares about it is not how awesome and huge animals are, but whether they love him. So across the whole span of the history of, of the earth, you can look at the 150 million years that the dinosaurs were in charge of everything. And in many respects, the dinosaurs were much, much better than us. They're much more exciting animals than we are. And yet, you know, they were not what God was working towards in the universe, ultimately. Yeah, so he was happy to let them die when the time came and let the whole process continue until it arrived on us. Um, and then we, who have been given a soul and a spirit and are able to relate to God, I think we can conclude that, that we're his focus. So in, in one way, I find that very encouraging. Does that kind of answer your question? Um, just going uh, f further back to the pure paleontology and uh, uh, evolution, this, um, uh, I think the word is giganticism, these sort of, this evolution of these huge animals. Uh, what were the conditions that enabled uh, you know, such evolution? Uh, how, were they, how was the earth different then to as it is now? You know, why aren't we surrounded by you know, 10 meter elephants and mm. you know, 2 meter wasps? Yeah, I mean, I really wish we did have 10 meter elephants, so I would, I would be in favor of that. As a fan of the Lord of the Rings films as well, I'm, I'd very much like to see them. Um, but there's a misapprehension here, it's a very common one, um, that the reason we had much bigger dinosaurs than we now have mammals was down to environmental uh, differences. Um, and there's this notion of a sort of Mesozoic hothouse where there was uh, elevated temperatures and higher uh, proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, it's not really true. 
So the thing to remember is the time of the dinosaurs lasted 150 million years. And in that time, the Earth went through all kinds of changes and catastrophes. Sometimes sea levels were higher than now, sometimes lower. Sometimes the oxygen levels were higher than now, sometimes lower. And all the way through all these different changes, and changes in temperature and carbon dioxide and all the rest of it, all the way through this, dinosaurs continued to thrive and to grow enormous. So in fact, the difference was not to do with the environment, but with the animals themselves. And I'm confident that if only we could replicate the genetics of Jurassic Park, and if we could bring back dinosaurs now, I think they would thrive in modern ecosystems. Uh, because it, it was um, differences in anatomy that made that possible. Um, and I, I kind of don't want to go too deeply into that with a, a general audience, but if you want to talk more about that later, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to go into it. Other questions? Any other questions? Do you have a question? Yeah, question. Um, yeah, another five-year-old child question here, but is it at all possible with the science that we have now and uh, you know, the research within genes and stem cells actually to ever recreate a dinosaur? Well, I don't think so, but you know, my fingers are still crossed and you, you, you never quite know. So what, one of the big problems is that DNA is just such a, a fragile molecule in, in geological terms. You know, it's, it just doesn't last that long. So um, we have recovered proteins from dinosaur bones and, and even blood cells, but the, the, the kind of detailed genetic information in the DNA just doesn't exist in anything we know about now, which is why in Jurassic Park they had to invent the idea of getting it from... Um, you remember the blood that had been embedded in amber uh, that a mosquito had swallowed. And I, I really know my Jurassic Park in detail. <laughs> but it, suppose we had the DNA, and suppose that even though it had kind of decayed, we had enough different strands that we could do some kind of probabilistic reconstruction. Even then, you've got the problem of, of how do you incubate that into an animal, and that's a very difficult problem to solve as well. You need the right kind of chemical environment, uh, and something that can nourish the, the growing embryo. Um, and it turns out that all these things make a huge difference. Uh, so grasshoppers and locusts, which are very, very different animals, are actually genetically identical, and the differences in how they develop. So a, a grasshopper egg may develop into a locust under different environmental considerations. So to bring back a dinosaur, we would need much more than just the DNA. So I'm not optimistic, but you never know. So here's actually a great... If I could remember this, I would have asked this question. How did T-Rex become the king? Oh, fantastic. Well, yeah. <laughs> I ask it then, so Tyrannosaurus rex for a long time was thought to be the biggest meat-eating dinosaur. We now know it wasn't. There are others that are bigger, but Tyrannosaurus is still best. Uh, and I mean this not just in a, an emotional resonance way, but for this very concrete reason, so that it, it was a, a, a kind of... A, it had reached a pitch of evolutionary perfection, if you like, as a, a perfect machine for delivering a heart-stoppingly powerful bite to prey that was trying to get away. So everything about that animal is focused on doing that one thing. Its jaws are far more powerful and robust than those of other meat-eating dinosaurs. If you, if you ever get a chance to look at a skeleton of, say, a, a Giganotosaurus, which is bigger than a T-Rex, its skull looks paper-thin and fragile in comparison. The Tyrannosaurus would bite so much harder. Its legs were longer and more slender. It would have been a better runner than the other very big meat-eaters. Uh, and its arms, of course, had reduced to almost nothing. Famously, it had very small forearms. Well, why? Because all of the mass that would have gone into the arms, making the animal front heavy, instead was going into the skull and this absurdly overpowered skull musculature that could crush you in half like we would crush one of those flying saucers with sherbet in them. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. You got a follow-up question? Judging by my question about how did T-Rex become the king... Well, shouldn't it not be Spinosaurus because it was a bigger and more powerful reptile than the T-Rex? No. 
<laughs> Spinosaurus, there's evidence for Spinosaurus being a little bigger than T-Rex, but nowhere near so powerful. So if you look at its skull, it's a kind of long, thin, crocodile-like skull. Its jaw-closing muscles would have been nowhere near as strong. It wouldn't have been as mobile because its legs were much shorter. Uh, and it wouldn't have been as intelligent either. So in, in all sorts of ways, you're thinking of the scene in Jurassic Park uh, when the, the Spinosaurus kills the T-Rex. That would never happen. Um, I mean, not only because they lived at different times and in different places, but even if you could bring them together, the Tyrannosaurus is faster, cleverer, stronger. Now that's the type of analysis I like. <laughs> I always thought it because there are, is, is T. Rex and Triceratops all American? Yes, uh, they is, lived is at the same the time. Um, in the, <laughs> <laughs> lived at the same time, uh, right at the end of the time of dinosaurs, both in North America. Can you explain what comments you have about some animals that have remained unchanged for millions and millions of years? And others have changed. Um, yeah, but what is the reasoning behind that? I mean, you yeah. have crocodiles essentially the same for 250 million years, and yet something else has changed. What's that all about? Yeah. Well, the first thing to say is, is that that often gets overstated. And uh, people who specialize in fossil crocodiles would laugh in your face at the idea that crocodiles have been unchanged for millions of years. So th there are changes. But you're absolutely right. As some animals change much more slowly than others. And the reason for that is evolution doesn't just happen on its own at random. It happens in response to selection pressures. So to pick a classic example, if you think about giraffes with their long necks, giraffe ancestors had shorter necks, you can imagine a series of droughts where only the animals that could reach the highest levels uh, would be able to get enough leaves to stay alive. So they pass on the genes that gave them the longer necks, uh, and their descendants have long necks, and the longest necks of those would survive, and so it goes on. So... This is basic natural selection. But now imagine uh, a group of giraffe ancestors living on a different continent uh, where there isn't a drought, or where the weather conditions are just different because of the you know, global movement of air currents. Then there is, there's no evolutionary pressure on them to evolve those long necks. Uh, and that's how it goes with some animals in some situations. So crocodiles are, are not a bad example at all. And it just turns out that if you're an ambush predator, uh, living in uh, rivers and lakes in Africa, then the crocodile body plan, as it got established long ago, just works well. There, there isn't a lot that can be done to make it better. So that's all that's happening. It's a lack of pressure for evolutionary change. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you a question about time scale. So, so um, dinosaurs were around for 150 million years, and they died out 65 million years ago. How long did it take before dinosaurs arrived on the Earth, and how does that work? For, how does that from work in the when? Well, exactly, from when. Right. Yeah, from, so so what, was, what was there before? Oh, well, the, and the how, did it, how did it lead up to, to dinosaurs? Yeah, the ancestors of dinosaurs are known as dinosauromorphs, which just means animals that are the same shape as dinosaurs. And then before that, you go back through a pretty well understood lineage of things that, that look kind of like crocodiles before that, kind of like um, reptiles, and then kind of like newts. Um, and again, people who specialize in those fossil groups would be cringing as I write off the, uh, the labyrinthodonts as kind of like newts. But you know, from the outside, to us, to you and me, that's what they would look like. So, and that takes you back, I, I don't know, maybe three or four hundred million years, and before that, it's all fish, and before that, it's all invertebrates. Does that more or less answer that? Yeah. Um, would it be fair to say that when the Bible was written, or you know, about the time, or, and the stories came to fore, that they wouldn't have known about? dinosaurs or fossils anyway, so therefore that's why it's not the mention. Yeah, they certainly wouldn't have had um, anything like a scientific understanding of dinosaurs. But I do think it's very likely that um, dinosaur fossils would have been found and wandered over and probably gave rise to the idea of dragons that, that crops up in lots of different cultures, doesn't it? Dragons of different kinds. Probably arises from people finding fossils and thinking, I wonder what this came from. Um, but how that reflects on the Bible, I don't really know. Hi, 
I wondered what you thought it says about the character of God. That is it? He's got a great sense of humour. He likes playing. <laughs> um, you know, what do you think God's up to with, with these dinosaurs. millions of years of yeah. playing with these animals and stuff? Yeah, I really don't know. The, the answer to that question depends on how intimately involved you think God is with the process of evolution. And I don't really think that's something we can know. So it's quite possible, if God is omnipotent, that he's looking down on each individual speciation and t- guiding things to be just the way he wants them to be, and that tri- Triceratops had three horns because God intended it to be so. That's possible. But it's equally possible that God just, if you like, laid out the rules of the game, how genetics would work, uh, how the different strengths of the bonds between different chemicals would mean that the DNA molecule is able to self-replicate, and then just let it go and see what happened. Uh, and I don't think we can really tell. But what I will say is I, I think either of those tells us something wonderful about God. So if Triceratops had three horns because God explicitly intended it to be so, then yes, I think that says something about uh, a sense of humor and a sense of wonder. But equally, if uh, you come across the phrase intelligent design, you could say that the most intelligent design would be just setting up the physical universe such that all the laws are set out in a way that evolution will happen and natural selection will work and that DNA is sufficiently mutable that you can get descent with modification but not so mutable that it just falls apart and everything dies. Then, then you could say that that, that approach will, in some ways would be an even more impressive bit of design. This isn't a chance to say it's now time to do the garden. Oh, yes, it is. Um, no, it's not. I'm going to do that later. Um, it's a question about whole communities and branches of the church right, mm. who believe mm. that the Bible says that the earth was created in yeah. seven days, mm. seven 24-hour periods with one day of rest, and that that only happened a few thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. And it sort of links in with what Claire was saying earlier about science and faith and so on. And I think, I mean, as well, there are lots of younger people here whose friends and uh, folk they might come across at school and college might be saying, well, how do you tie that up? It doesn't make sense. And yet we still, even as as adults, and I don't know whether there's anyone in our congregation, in our community, who believes that. I don't. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds like you don't either, because... Uh, You're talking about several millions of years worth of um, life of Mm. dinosaurs and so on. How how do we discuss that with people who hold those positions Mm. so fervently? So we're talking about young earth creationists, and that's Christians who... The book of Genesis in a very specific way, where these first two or three chapters are like a, a science textbook, and they're telling us exactly what happened in what order and why. Now, for reasons that I'll go on to explain later, especially if somebody asks me the right question, uh, I I don't subscribe to that way of thinking. Uh, I think it's a mistake. But I, I also don't want to be hostile towards Christians who do think that. The thing that I insist on is not that they have to agree with me, but that they not impose their understanding of what the Bible is on other people. The reason that's desperately important is because uh, we ran an alpha years and years ago when we lived in North London, and there was a girl who came to that, um, who in many ways accepted Christianity and wanted to be a Christian. And the reason that she wasn't is because her parents, who were young earth creationists, had told her, you cannot be a Christian unless you accept this version of what Genesis means. Now, that's desperately unwise and desperately sad, and happily, we were able to disabuse her of that notion. But what, what I want to say, say to anybody here who is a young earth creationist and who believes that the earth is 6,000 years old, then um, I, do, I want to gently say to you, I think you're mistaken. But more importantly, what I really want to say is, please don't let that be part of your evangelism and far less part of what you insist on from non-Christians. 
because the heart of Christianity lies a million miles from that in the character of God, in his goodness and his greatness uh, and in his love for us. So those are the things that we want to be focusing on when we're talking to non-Christians. Are you, does that answer your question? Or are you, you, did you, it does. Did you want to ask a follow-up? No? Okay. Uh. Thanks. Uh, what do you think the biblical or spiritual backup for our desire to understand a past that doesn't actually even like relate to us? Do you think there's something biblical or spiritual about why you want to know more about dinosaurs, even though you won't ever meet one, Mike? I'm sorry, I didn't completely follow that question. Are you asking why we have this intellectual curiosity? I'm asking if you think that that's biblical or spiritual. Your, yeah, your desire to know something. Well, I think it's like part of, of what it means to say that we're made in the image of God. I think that, that curiosity, that fascination, the desire to understand the universe that, that God has furnished us with, I think all comes from that sense of a connection between us and God, yes. I'm not ignoring you if you, it's just I'm giving people who haven't asked a question a chance. Can I ask uh, your particular views on, uh, the, we hear various theories about the reason for the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, mm. but what your particular views on that are. Thanks. Yeah. It turns out there have been something like 30 different formally published theories of why the dinosaurs became extinct. Uh, some of those have been thoroughly discredited. Some of them are still current. What we know for certain is this. Um, an enormous bolide that's either a, a meteor or a comet, uh, hit the Earth uh, just off the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico about 65 million years ago, and shortly thereafter the dinosaurs went extinct. Now, that looks suspicious. So <laughs> we don't know for certain that that was the reason the dinosaurs went extinct, where there was, a, a, as well as that, there was a huge increase in volcano activity around that sort of hundreds of thousands of years around that time. So that may have played a part, but it, it does look very much like, you know, if you found a gun and a, a, a dead body, you would be reasonable in thinking there's probably a connection between them. Okay. You're on very quickly. About the T-Rex, they s <laughs> no, 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 no. They say <laughs> that they hunted triceratops the most. Is that correct? Almost certainly not, because they weren't idiots. So if you were a Tyrannosaurus <laughs> and you had the choice of either hunting an animal the size of an elephant with three huge horns sticking out the front of it, or you had the choice of picking off a juvenile hadrosaur that was the size of a cow that couldn't defend itself and you could just eat it up in one delicious bite. Which would you do? <laughs> Great question, Josh. <laughs> oh, sorry, I keep missing it. <laughs> uh, just going back to my earlier point about sin and death, um, I appreciate that this is not necessarily your field of expertise. However, I recognize that this must have been something that you thought about, um, which is why I'm interested to hear what you think. Um, I'm not a young earth creationist. However, I'm unerring in my interpretation of the Bible that all creation is fallen, uh, not just humans. Um, so, for example, if someone who is not a believer asks me about earthquakes and natural disasters, that's how I corroborate that. So if we're suggesting that um, spiritual death occur occurred as a result of humans, which is definitely true, and hence separating spiritual death and physical death, uh, then don't we need something to explain that physical death uh, without suggesting that God has designed something that is uh, inherently faulty? Well, you said a very interesting thing there, I think accidentally, and your exact words were, uh, I'm unerring in my interpretation of the Bible. Now, I assume you meant that you believe the Bible doesn't err, uh, that the Bible is not in, in error. But what you said is that you're certain about your interpretation of it. And that's where I'd always just be careful. I, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm certain about very much of this at all. Because, you know, those early chapters of Genesis are written in such a poetic form. They really are open to lots of different forms of interpretation. Let me give you another example. My favorite psalm, Psalm 139, 
which talks about how God sees us wherever we are. He knows us, that he loves us all the while. Now, towards the end of that, the psalmist writes this. Um, I wasn't hidden from you when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Now, that passage is obviously talking about growing inside the womb before being born. But it's expressed poetically as saying woven together in the depths of the earth. Now, someone who wants to be a biblical literalist and who is going to insist on their interpretation of the Bible would have to say that where babies come from is that they gestate down in the earth and then teleport into the womb just before birth. Now, no one thinks that. Obviously, I'm not saying you think that. But it's, it's an example of how when we read the Bible, to, to understand it accurately doesn't always necessarily mean to understand it literally. And often we just need to use our minds and think about what was the writer of this passage actually trying to communicate. So with the psalm, the answer is obvious. With early Genesis, it's not so obvious, and that's why I don't insist on an interpretation. But I don't think we have to believe that physical death entered the world at the time that humans chose to sin. Well, but you're also saying that there's something, somehow, your interpretation of um, pre-man, that there, was, there were flaws in God's creation at that point because stuff fell apart, Is that, that it wasn't a perfect creation. Is that... Well, I mean, first of all, I, I'm not sure we can judge what constitutes perfection. And if God thinks something is perfect and we don't, I would tend to go with his assessment. But also, um, depending on how deep you want to go into, into Christian theology, there's also the idea of the fall of Satan. So how did that come about and when and how early? Uh, and the Bible doesn't spell any of this out at all. We only get it in poetic form. Uh, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to believe that happened before the physical universe was created. So maybe it was always affected by imperfection for that reason. But again, I want to come back to my core point, which is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've, if I've missed anybody, I do. I just want to comment on the, um, on the idea of perfection, that creation you know, was perfect. That's never stated in the creation story. It, it just says God looked at you know, this and that and saw that it was good. Mm. Now, good and perfect are two different things. Yeah. And then, of course, when God created man, it was very good. Mm. Um, so I do love that. Um, mm. And um, I'm no spring chicken, but I've been a Christian since I was a teenager. Mm. So I've you know, grappled with those questions of evolution um, versus... Versus, Bi versus Bible and Christianity um, for a long time and until somebody put it quite simply that the Bible is not a science book. It's, the Bible is about God and people and people's relationship with God and that's what it communicates. It, it, you know, it couldn't be because science changes all the time. Science is what man has created um, to investigate things. Um, so, yeah, it's n never meant to be a, a science book. Yeah, I think that's an excellent and important point. Okay. I mean, say... Mm, mm, yeah, I, know. I can't see anybody's hand. Any other... Well, no. Oh, straight over your head, John. <laughs> um, Going back to New Earth Creationism, um, how would New Earth Creationists explain fossils, and why do you think it's a weak argument? I'm so sorry, I still didn't hear that. Sorry. How would New Earth Creationists explain fossils, and why is it a weak explanation? Right. Well, because I'm not a young Earth Creationist, I don't feel obliged to come up with an explanation for them. So I, I don't really know. To me. I've, I've heard the idea that God put fossils in the ground as a test for us. Now, I've also heard that characterized as the lying God theory. And it, to me, that would raise much deeper questions about God's character than um, anything else we might come up with. Uh, I've also heard the notion that the devil put fossils in the ground to tempt us. Uh, again, I, I just don't really buy the idea that the devil's that clever and that powerful and, and that God would just stand by and say, sure, go ahead. But um, you, you would really need to ask a young earth creationist. Any more, any more questions? 
Any more? Any Come more? on, let's take Pick a Tyrannosaurus up. question. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a T-Rex question. No, it's a night. Wasn't Ankylosaur the, one of the most strongest dinosaurs in the whole world? Yeah, Ankylosaurus was a fantastically strongly armoured dinosaur. And, and actually, it is another Tyrannosaurus question because Ankylosaurus <laughs> lived at the same time as Tyrannosaurus and probably was almost invulnerable even to Tyrannosaurus because his armour was so heavy. So, uh, yeah, it would be a... If I had to live in the Cretaceous, then I would have liked to be an Ankylosaurus. Is, is there a, a, a Christian community of paleontologists? Do you find you're in the minority? Yeah. How's that? Oh, out? that's interesting. I don't know of a, a, an actual group that you can join, but I mean, I'm certainly not alone. There are plenty of us. Um, the head of the paleontology department at Bristol, uh, which is where I'm a research associate, is Mike Benton. He's a Christian. Uh, my co-author, Matt Wadle, who was in the picture uh, with the um, giraffe titan skull early on in the presentation. Um, pardon? <laughs> Are they all called Mike? No, no, he's called Matt. <laughs> Matt Wadle. Uh, I, and I know several others, so we are in a minority for sure, but then Christians are in a minority around the world anyway, so that, that's not surprising. But well, I'm very far from being alone. Any other questions? I oh, there's a new asker. Do you find that by being a Christian in your field, you're taken less seriously than others? I'm sorry, do I find that by being a Christian? In your field, you're taken less seriously than the other doctors. No, not at all. Uh, so paleontology is fantastic for this, and I think all the sciences are really, that work is judged on the strength of the work and not judged by the person who made the work. Uh, and you can tell that's true because some people in the field are real jerks, but people still uh, admire their work. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that word in church. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, admire. That's the rude word. <laughs> uh, this will be my final question. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for answering my previous questions and uh, for admitting that ultimately we don't know. Um, what, my point was in suggesting that I'm unerring in my interpretation of something. Um, I think that there are uh, coherent themes throughout the Bible that are unerring. For example, Jesus is the Son of God. Mm. Um, that's a central point on which we build our doctrine around. And for me, uh, the point that uh, all creation is fallen is also an unerring point. So that's what I mean by unerring. Um, so for me, that's a central point in which I build the rest of my worldview around, mm. and I expect to see evidence fall around it because it's what the Word of God says. So I wondered if there was any, um, for you and your work, uh, central points of doctrine um, that also formulate, you know, as unerring points of your worldview. Uh, if you mean my scientific worldview, then no, by design there are none. So it's in the essence of how we do science that, that in a sense, everything is up for grabs. If new evidence comes in that uh, two objects repulse each other instead of attracting, then we'll overturn Newton's law of gravitation. Now, obviously that hasn't happened. It's very unlikely it will happen. But there's nothing we cling to in that sense. If you're asking what forms my worldview as a Christian, absolutely, it's that Jesus is the Son of God, that he loved us. And that's the essence of, of the, the very, very core of Christianity. Can I ask a question? Because this is one I wanted somebody to ask and nobody has yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mike, it's all very well you saying that we can just take the early chapters of Genesis as being parable or allegory, but if we're going to do that with Genesis, why don't we do it with the Gospels as well? And how can we be sure that Jesus was real? Huh? You didn't think of that, did you? <laughs> well, that's an excellent question. Thank you. For that. Uh, a lot of this just comes down to textual analysis. C.S. Lewis made the point. Um, he was a, a classic scholar uh, at both Oxford and Cambridge. So whichever of those you, you like, you get what you want. He made the point that the text itself is very different in different parts of the Bible. So as a man who had made his living uh, studying myths and legends, uh, he found that some parts of the Old Testament very much read like that 
Whereas the New Testaments, and particularly the Gospels, don't at all have that quality. So when you read through, for example, the Gospel of Luke, it just reads more like a newspaper report than a novel. It really is a sequence of what happened in the order as best he remembers it. In a sense, there's very little editorial control in the Gospels. Sometimes there are things in there that you almost think, well, why did that get in? Why was that important enough? And why doesn't it tell us more about this or that? And the reason is because they were just written by the people who were there or who had spoken to the people who were there, writing down what they understood about the situation. So everything in the Gospels just has the literary character of being a a straightforward historical account as best as the people who wrote those things could make it. So that's very, very different from those early chapters. And there's simply no uh, picture language interpretation or metaphorical understanding of the Gospels that makes sense. (coughs) The only way to read them is as an account of the truth as it was understood by the people who wrote them. But thank you for that question. I I did want to make that point. (laughs) I think we may stop stop there unless there are any other T-Rex related questions. Probably would be fair as the one... Oh, oh, Okay, from the series to Dippy. Most of us will think about Dippy, who's the big dinosaur, has made an exit with Mm. four large legs. And I understand he's coming up with only two. Uh, and you've explained why he's lost two. Some, why, uh, sorry, why that skeleton's been no, taken what, down? No, no, my question, he, I'm just helping people remember who he sorry. is. My question is, he's coming back completely different. Why did they get it so wrong originally? Uh, now, I actually haven't heard about that, but I'm pretty sure I can answer your question anyway. Um, the skeleton that was mounted there for all those years, it was a, a cast of pretty much the first complete sauropod, uh, which was excavated by the Carnegie Expedition uh, in the very early 1900s. And when they recovered that, although I called it complete, it was missing its front legs and a couple of other bits. So in the first version of that skeleton that was mounted, they substituted in some sauropod legs they happened to have lying around, which in fact were from Camerosaurus. Um, and you know, 100 years of scholarship has shown that they had very different front legs from uh, Diplodocus. So I imagine that what they're doing is they're now fitting uh, some casts of, of legitimate Diplodocus front legs to that skeleton, which would be a really good upgrade. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry, Akeem. Thank you. Um, so this is an evolution question. Um, so when I think about evolution, I, I kind of have two categories of microevolution, which are observable facts, like natural selection, for example, and then you have macroevolution. Um, and I think when we discuss macroevolution, um, some people say it's you know, the realm of speculation. I think maybe when we're discussing macroevolution, do you think it's necessary to have a division? For example, you have science and then you have the philosophy of science. So I kind of err on the side of when we're discussing macroevolution, it's more philosophy of science rather than mm. science. Yeah. So a distinction is sometimes drawn within science between micro and macro, uh, but not because anybody perceives that they're two different things. They're, they're really different ends of the same process, or points on a continuum. So some evolutionary biologists specialize in macroevolution. They're interested in questions like how did flight evolve, whereas others will focus on micro questions like why do these two species of antelope have slightly different horns? Um, but the evidence is there for both of them. So um, I may as well toss this in. Here's, here's three kinds of evidence that evolution has happened for anybody who's skeptical. Uh, one is that we observe it in the wild. There are lots of examples. Among the best known are, are Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. Another is that it's been observed in the laboratory, which is interesting recent experiments with populations of bacteria that have been separated out, subjected to different environments, and have evolved in different ways. And of course, because bacteria reproduce much more quickly than large animals, you can see thousands of generations and see how that changes. Um, now, both of those are good ways of observing microevolution happening. Um, but you can't see macroevolution because you just can't run the experiments for long enough, or you can't hang around in the Galapagos long enough to watch a lizard evolve wings or something like that. Uh, And for those, you need the third line of evidence, and that's the fossil record. And the fossil record is very good. 
it, it's getting better all the time. So it used to be that in, in sessions like this, people would say, oh, but what about the big gap in the fossil record between X and Y? And it's been quite funny to watch through the years, every one of those gaps just gradually filling up. So the transition from fish to amphibians, for example, used to be a bit of a black hole. Uh, more and more specimens coming out of Greenland and, and uh, Scandinavia, filling it up and showing us a, a really neat, clean transition. And the same for things like uh, whales returning from land to the water, um, which you just said like that. It sounds like a just-so story. But in fact, the fossil evidence is now really nice and shows us how that happened. So that's the third line of evidence for evolution, is what the fossil record shows us, and that's where you will see macroevolution. Um. This is more of a science question, but um, could you argue that sort of through evolution you've got macro and micro evolution, but macro evolution can happen on the same time scale because of homeobox genes? Like, sorry. Um, so you, Do you have know what? lots of genes, but they, have, they don't have Let equal roles. Let me stop roles. you. Uh, not because of anything you're saying, but because of my profound ignorance of genetics. So oh. as soon as you said... Homeo box genes? Can I explain it in simple terms? Yeah, okay, but I but, want to warn you that I probably won't have a good answer. But okay. go ahead. But um, it's, sorry, it's more of a science question. But like, the, a homeo box gene is essentially a gene that controls where an arm grows or where your head grows. Mm -hmm. So in all animals, they're pretty much the same. You've got the head, body, tail. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you have a mutation, a change in homeo box gene, it will change your body a lot more than a change in, you know, how to make hemoglobin would. Mm -hmm. So you could have, like, a tiny change and a huge change with the same amount of mutation. I see. And then that would cause evolution to, to occur a lot faster. So essentially mm -hmm. you could, in a lab, cause a fly to grow an eye from its back leg in the same time scale as, well, changing a much smaller change. So essentially it could be scientifically testable of macroevolution, would you argue? Right, but in experimental terms, you could either cause that by direct genetic manipulation, which I think is what you're referring to, yeah. but then what you're seeing is not evolution. It's a thing oh, that you have done. Okay. So if you're running it as an experiment, all you can do is wait for millions of generations of flies and hope that just the right mutation occurs in the yeah. environment you've set up. Yeah, so, so I guess then you're talking about sort of that side of evolution and then mutation hmm. because you know those are typical two different types of variation oh variations through mutations and variations through natural selection right yeah yeah oh through um we can talk more afterwards if you i would actually like to know more about the genetic side of this so please come and teach me <laughs> We might uh, might be time for two more questions, and then we should. Yeah, this is a bit of a follow-up from what you were saying, what this lady was saying a, a moment ago. When you talk about changes in bacteria and what have you, you've got to factor in the, the number of generations they have over a given period. What always stumps me about evolution is when they talk about macroevolution in terms of the mammals, mm -hmm. and the generations there are much longer lived. So the chances of these adaptations occurring you know, literally by chance, are fantastically, or seem to be fantastically small mm. in order to do some of the, make some of the changes, the controls that if people, the scientists have to make in order for those changes to take place. There are so many controls, you think that, you know, that, that throws chance out of the window. Well, that's why you need millions of years. Yeah, but you don't get that in a generation of mammals, do you? No. No, that's right. So, so major evolutionary changes take many, many generations, and that's slower for mammals. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just, just a follow-up question on, on what that brother said over there. Um, a lot of times people try to answer the, the questions we have about evolution with millions of years, mm. but what's observable in science is something like cancer, right? The, the mammals can't get over cancer. So how do you explain us being able to evolve from one species to other with millions of years, but we're unable to answer the question of cancer, a basic cell mutation to the body? Sorry, what's the question of cancer? So, so the question is, if a human being can't survive cancer because of cell mutation, how do you expect me to believe a human being can evolve into something else? Oh, I see. Oh, well, that's easy. Uh, cancer is a purely destructive mutation. So for every beneficial mutation that eventually gives rise to an evolutionary transition, there are thousands of destructive ones that just kill the animal that has it. 
So evolution in that sense is a very wasteful process. So every time an animal has a cancer that kills it, you can see it in a sense as a sort of failed attempt at evolution. And it's the one in a million mutations that actually yields something advantageous is the one that can then result in a, an evolutionary lineage. Let's stop there. Um, well, should we have one more T-Rex question? Yeah, let's finish with T-Rex. Yeah, come on. T-Rex question. <laughs> this is about involving this time. Do you know dinosaurs, when they like, grow bigger, like amphibians grow into much more powerful dinosaurs, how on earth could they evolve? Well, I mean, that's the, the core question of my research. So what you have to do is follow the, the link here and download all the papers and read those to get the definitive <laughs> answer. Josh, that's going to keep you busy. That's going to keep you busy. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. Um, can we Thank show you. our appreciation for Mike? <laughs> really, um, really inspiring. For me, whenever um, I get into this topic, not being a scientist, for me it does point me towards the wonder of creation and that points me towards God and towards Jesus. And I thought you did that um, fabulously today as well. So thank you so much.